uh, uh, talks on computing systems series at CMU Silicon Valley. We have this on Tuesdays when school's in session, um, and uh, we've had you know all sorts of exciting people speak, uh, and today was no exception. Um, and if you're interested in it, uh, just uh, TOCS, look online, and you'll be able to find uh, the schedule quite easily. And also, you'll be able to find the legacy of all of the talks that have happened. Uh, in front of you is a microphone. It's turned on. So rattle your keys if you want us all to hear the keys rattling. Um, but it's turned on so that you can speak and ask questions easily. Uh, I don't like one person to ask more than a couple questions. Um, and uh, at 2.30, we end with uh, going out into the hall and, and meet and greet. And uh, there's a little bit of soda and, and cookies. Um, and so that, that's another good thing. So uh, we kind of try to wrap it up and get just a couple questions at the end. Um, and um, so there are going to be people online watching also. And uh, as well, uh, if you like this lecture, you can ask, you know, encourage people to look at it later because um, our dear friend has actually allowed us to, to share it online. Uh, Dave, Dave's uh, been a prolific uh, language designer and a uh, very important computer scientist. In fact, he's an ACM fellow, whatever that means. But, but uh, he's been a very influential person in, uh, in, in how Java developed, among other things. Self was a language that was a, another much more exciting language in some people's minds that was going on at Sun at the same time that Java was starting to be integrated. And now he's off uh, doing other things. Um, and and um, I think it's really exciting work thinking about the future of languages and programming of the new kinds of architectures that are coming down, distributed and parallel, and so on. So uh, without further ado, um, thank you for coming. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. So I'm going to try to convince you that everything you know about parallel programming is wrong today. And let me start by backing up. Smalltalk was a very influential language. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. And how we got it was some folks down the road at Xerox Park decided to live in the future, and they used money to buy themselves machines that would not be available for years uh, from when they had them to the to normal people because they were very expensive. And what they got for their money, they got a lot of cycles, which let them have an interpreted language, a language with dynamic dispatch, garbage collection, small methods, and made it easy to abstract uh, things like data structures into collection classes. And that was then. Well, this is now. So instead of a lot of cycles and graphics coming down the road, what we've got coming down the road for us it looks like it's many core. Uh, people with applications want to run them on more and more data. Clock speeds uh, have basically leveled off not actually decreased a little bit on uh, the newest processors. <laughs> Device density keeps increasing. So what that means is one very likely path for architecture to take is we will have lots and lots of cores on a chip. And these things will be everywhere. And systems like this will have less fast memory per thread. Uh, spatial locality will be critical. And what I'm going to talk about today is We'll have many, many, many cycles at our disposal. Each one might be a bit slower. And they're all going to be happening at the same time. Now, in this vision, as in many others, there are two fundamental issues, performance and correctness. Let me talk first about the performance issue. OK, how many people here have heard of Amdahl's Law? Great. So here's my summary of it. If we have an application that, say, takes 10 seconds running on one core and nine seconds of it are parallelizable, but one second is essentially serial, well, if we run it on 10 cores, or say even nine, the parallelizable part gets parallelized. But the serial part stays the same and takes that one second. So the net effect is, even though we've increased the number of cores by a factor of 10, we're still taking two seconds to run that program. We've only gotten a factor of two gain in performance. And in fact, if we had an infinite number of cores, well, the parallel part could be really fast, but the serial part still takes that second. So 
that's kind of what Amdahl's law says. The serial part gets you stuck. And what's the answer to that if we want to scale up and exploit the parallelism? Well, the answer is we have to get rid of that serial part. In other words, in order to scale, we're going to have to get rid of the serial portion. But what that means is that we can't have synchronization anymore. And this is big. So synchronization is a problem. If you have too much of it, things run too slow. If you have too little of it, you, you experience errors. And I'm talking about getting rid of it. So what's that going to mean? But I still say that what we have to do is get rid of that synchronization. Now, that's hard. And you know, why is that hard in terms of how we program things? Well, let's look at the other half, which is correctness. Uh, how many of you have had an experience sort of like this guy writing parallel programs? As things get more and more parallel, you have this feeling that it's just really hard and it hurts your brain. I know I've been there. And the experience a lot of people have, not everybody, is it's just too hard to get it right when things are parallel. And not only that, but they feel like they couldn't even try without synchronization. But we think in the future, there are going to be lots of important programs running with no synchronization at all. And we call this style of programming, we're trying to come up with some nice catchy phrases. Maybe it's anti-lock, maybe it's race and repair, end-to-end non-determinism. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, I mean, the kicker is you're not always going to get the exact answers out of your program without synchronization. So. I think that what's going to be really important going into the future are programs that get the wrong answer quickly, but the answers are still right enough. And as we look more at this topic, there seems to be this fundamental trade-off here. In fact, it's everywhere. Performance trades off against correctness. The clock speed on all your computers is slow enough so that they run correctly enough. It could be, the clock could be a lot faster if you could tolerate more errors. A digital arbiter down at the circuit level trades this off, and software in the large trades this off too. So here's how this talk's going to go. I'm going to give you uh, my favorite example of this trade-off. Then I'm going to talk about the implications for this view on language design. But that's going to be fairly brief. Then I'm going to talk about... Um, programming this way, and the unifying notion is mitigate, race, and repair. And you'll see what that means. First, I'll show you at an application algorithm level, as I've described fresheners and breadcrumbs, and then we'll dive in and talk about data structure. So here we go. Here's an example. This is going to be Romeo and Juliet. And by the way, if you don't know the ending already, I'm going to spoil it for you. So. You know, how many people have seen Romeo and Juliet, the Shakespeare play? Yeah, okay. So you know how it goes, right? Uh, they want to get married. Their parents don't want them to get married. Friar Lawrence hatches a plan. Uh, the plan is Juliet will fake her death with a drug, and Friar John is going to be sent to tell Romeo about the plan. However, Shakespeare has to put in some plot twists. Uh, John will be delayed by a quarantine, so... Romeo will hear that Juliet's dead from a servant. He'll go to the tomb. He'll kill himself, thinking Juliet's dead. Uh, Friar Lawrence arrives with the message, but he can't hear it because Romeo is dead. And Juliet wakes to find a dead Romeo, at which point she does the only thing she could possibly do, namely, she kills herself. Okay, so here's the plot summary of Romeo and Juliet. But you know, we are computer scientists. So here's how we look at the whole situation. Here is what's supposed to happen. And you can, you can follow the chart here. The friar devises the plan, gives Juliet the drug. She fakes her death. 
The plan is sent to Romeo. He should hear of the plan, goes to the tomb. She awakens. They elope. And we have a nice, happy ending. But of course, the way the play goes is this way. Because of a race condition, there's an incorrect result. So the delay on the message getting delivered means that Romeo hears of the death. He goes to the tomb. He kills himself. Then, you know, he would hear of the plan, but he's dead. She awakens. She sees he's dead. She kills herself. So you know, race conditions can have bad consequences. But here's what's interesting as far as this performance correctness trade-off. If we're willing to give up a little performance and put a delay in the system so that Romeo waits a little bit after he hears of the death, then he could hear of the plan before he actually kills himself go to the tomb, and everything is hunky-dory again. So that's just an example out of uh, real life, literature, whatever, of this, how you can always play this game. You add this delay, things seem to get more correct. Now, before I go on, I'm going to dispose of some topics that I don't intend to talk much about today. The first one is lock-free algorithms. Uh, this is kind of the state of the art in dealing with this stuff. And it's a little bit of a uh, misrepresentation in words because even though there aren't these big locks, there are these atomic instructions that are used. And so you have these critical sections inside these instructions. Things like compare and swap, larks and sticks. Has everyone heard of compare and swap? You know what it does? Okay. Larks and sticks is the, the IBM power thing. And you know the way this works is these instructions atomically do a bunch of stuff. They can fail. If so, the caller has to retry. The programmer doesn't see the waiting because it's inside the instruction. And these things implicitly synchronize across the cores. And what that means is these probably won't scale as we increase the number of cores on systems. More about that later. Uh, some folks, um, I guess this started in the Linux kernel community, have this thing called read, copy, update. And this is very clever. Uh, the readers can run concurrently with updaters. The updaters will work on a copy if they have to. And when the readers are done, the updaters serially swap in the updated copy. Uh, there are great lessons to learn from this, but it still pays synchronization costs, especially with multiple updaters. But it does, since it uses synchronization, it does uh, have guarantees about the result. Functional programming. Uh, this, a lot of people tout this as a solution. The parallelism. The key idea is uh, we don't have visible side effects, so that hides the ordering dependencies. But it's hard uh, for many people who want to think of a system in terms of having state to uh, match it to this model, because there is no real state in this model. And worse yet, it still has functional composition. That is, uh, a function really can't do a computation until it knows the values coming into it. And there are still ordering dependencies, still synchronization required, and still a scaling problem, I would say. Uh, Every year at Uppsala, my favorite conference, someone comes up with another deterministic programming approach. The idea here is we'll let the programmer specify the dependencies at a high level. The system will reorder things and parallelize them as necessary. Uh, but you still have synchronization. And in my view, these approaches don't push the programmer hard enough to relinquish synchronization and determinism. Uh, actors, uh, every few months it seems like there's a new actor language. And what's great is within an actor things are serial, but between actors you have these messages flying around. And uh, you know, messages from two actors may arrive at a third in either order. So you still have to worry about non-determinism. And uh, the semantics of the message queues in many actor systems relies on synchronization. So there might be a scaling problem. In other words, all these other approaches have this problem that they still want to give you a way to get the right answers from your program. And what's going on is we like certainty. It's how we're trained. It's how we think. 
We want to know that a variable holds a particular thing with 100% probability. We want to know if things happen in a particular order. Uh, we want to know that 1 plus 1 always equals 2. I have a good question. Yeah. So I have a quick question. Uh, what about transactional memory? You didn't mention that. Okay, we can come back to that later. I think there are real problems with transactional memory. First, it requires synchronization, so I don't think it'll scale. Secondly, transactions don't nest very easily, so I don't think they'll scale that way. But come back to it at the end of the talk. Thank you. Uh, here are the implications for ways we program. I think we have to move to think in terms of biology and not mathematics. So um, there are these biological systems with many, many, many individuals all doing their thing in parallel. And the whole system uh, manifests very complicated, organized behavior, even though there's no global synchronization going on. Yeah, that's, that's a good way. Adam Smith talked about emergence in the economy. And I think emergence is going to be real critical here, too. So, for example, birds don't need pie calculus. You know, Craig Reynolds has shown that with three simple rules, each bird avoids crowding the local flock mates, each bird steers towards the average heading, each bird kind of moves towards its local neighbors, you get flocking behavior, which keeps the birds more or less together. Um, and it, it just works without the kind of synchronization and determinism that we have learned a way to program. And just as a silly demonstration, here's a movie we made simulating the bird flocking algorithm. It's running on 50 cores on a Tylera chip, which is a many core chip. It was written in Smalltalk. It's running on a virtual machine we wrote. Uh, there's 50 way parallelism here. There's no application level synchronization. Each bird is just its own thread. It looks around. It does its thing. So when we try to think about what a programming language might look like, uh, I think there's going to be this notion of ensemble. That's our name for it. It's a thing that is either one or many things, depending on how you squint at it, just like a Necker cube is either one way or the other, depending on how you squint. And uh, the individuals will do parallel activities in an unsynchronized way. But when you have ensembles, Suddenly, you have all these other questions, like um, in this case, does everything happen independently in parallel? Is there any serialization? Do I want all the members to do something? A few of the members, the nearest members, some percentage of the members. And so we're looking at adding this new thing we're calling a, an adverb uh, inspired by APL operators to the basic programming paradigm. So in object-oriented terms, we have a receiver, a selector, arguments, and a modifier adverb. In other words, subject, verb, and adverb. Question. Yeah. How are you picking these words in contrast to the 90s when we were talking about swarm and hive? Okay, let's ask me that again at the end of the talk. So what I want to move on to now is talk about how this I want to make it more concrete for you. So I'm going to give you a real application that we've modeled and shown you how we've applied this way of thinking to the application. So our particular application is called OLAP Cubes, Online Analytical Processing. Um, it's something that uh, is out there in, in the world and is a very important commercial application. You could think of it as a multi-dimensional spreadsheet a spreadsheet with multi-dimensions. Each dimension is hierarchical. And uh, for example, along the time dimension, you could ask for all the widgets that were sold in March or all the widgets that were sold in 2008. So it automatically does roll-ups along the hierarchy and supports formulae just like spreadsheets. Uh, the one we're interested in runs in memory. It's uh, not represented by a relational database. Uh, users will be querying it and updating it all at the same time, running with lots of users, and they want scalability. I mean, imagine uh, the biggest business you can putting every transaction into one of these things, and they and being able to have huge numbers of users entering data, changing data, 
querying the results of the formulas all at the same time. And, and that's, a, that's an important application. Folks want it. And um, the current ones hit this scaling wall. They don't scale uh, enough. You can throw more cores at them, but they don't really scale very well. And um, one serious problem is this readers, writers, lock contention. Because these things use synchronization, because you have updates and queries going on. More details in a minute. So what we did, we implemented a model of this application. And uh, being object-oriented thinkers, this is how we did it. We said, we've got data cells. They're linked by one-way constraints. The graph could be any shape as long as it's acyclic. There are two kinds of cells. There are entered cells in which the user actually types in the data and computed cells that hold the results of formulas and aggregations, which are these big sums. Uh, the computed cells need to be computed on demand because there's just so many of them, you wouldn't want to compute them eagerly. And the results need to be cached because otherwise it'd be kind of slow. So here's a picture. We uh, used a fish market example out of a textbook. And up at the top, you see these uh, blue boxes. These represent entered cells. So each entered cell has a time, in this case, a year and a quarter, a kind of fish, and what's called a measure. In other words, the unit price or the quantity. So all the way over on the left there at the top, you can see that in Q1 of 2010, uh, there was cod sold at a price of two, uh, two bucks a pound, say. The next sell over says, oh, and by the way, there were 10 pounds of that thing sold. Now down here in the second row, we have the computed cells. And again, all the way over on the left for those remote folks. There is one calculating the cost of the cod in Q1 of 2010. And that's the product of two of the entered cells. Uh, there's another one uh, with the quantity of tuna in 2010, not just Q1, but all of it. So that's the sum of the two quarters. Our year only has two quarters on this slide. And finally, uh, the quantity which is the sum of all the quantities of all the fish over all time. And you can see in a more realistic example that would have a huge fan in. So the naive way of implementing this stuff with the caching is as follows. Let's suppose uh, we start with a unit price of 2, a quantity of 10, and Alice comes along and wants to know the cost of the cod for that time period. Well, the first thing that happens is she'll look at the cache, see it's empty, and then do a computation and put the results of that in the cache. And, and then that value is returned as a result of the query. Then later, Bob comes along, changes the unit price, and validates the cache so that when Kathy comes along, she sees that the cache is empty again and she'll recompute it with the new value and get the right answer. And of course, this works fine in the serial case, as I've just narrated, but it's going to fail once we have concurrency. So let's show you that. Here, here we go again. Alice comes along. She requests the value. The cache is empty. She starts calculating. But while she's calculating, Bob comes along and changes one of those inputs after that input's already been factored into the calculation. Well, Bob invalidates the, the cache just like he's supposed to do, but it does no good because the calculation's already started. The calculation finishes. It stores this value in the cache based on the old value of the unit price. And from then on, everyone else who reads that just gets the wrong result out of the cache because of the race condition. Is this all clear to everybody? Sounds like right. Great. OK, now, here's how I was taught to deal with this in school. And that is with synchronization. So we're going to have a lock that either allows any number of readers or one writer, <coughs> but not both at the same time. And in this solution, what happens is, as before, Alice requests the value, gets the lock, 
right, and starts our calculation. So now when Bob comes along and tries to change that unit price, he has to wait for the law. Then the calculation finishes. Alice gets a value based on stale data, releases the lock, but now Bob gets the lock. Now he can change the unit price and invalidate the cost cash and release the lock. And so with this lock, basically, you get the right values stored in the cache, even though things go slower. And that's kind of how we were taught to do it. Well, how I was taught to do it. But you know that I'm not going to like this because I don't think this is going to scale. So here's the approach we've come up with, which kind of shows how you start thinking of things in this brave new world. What happens is the calculation commences, Bob changes the price, and invalidates the cash. Well, you know, so far it's the same as the wrong scenario before. The calculation finishes, the wrong value goes in the cash, and if someone requests the cost, she's going to get the wrong value. But here's the idea. We take some of those extra cores and we say, visit caches and recalculate them. I don't care if the cache says it's correct. Recalculate it anyway and cache that recalculated result. Well, then, once that cache is freshened, and we call these extra threads fresheners, uh, users will get the right answer. So the inputs change again, and then hopefully a freshener will visit in a reasonable amount of time. So this is the first concrete example in this talk of what we're calling the race and repair approach. No synchronization. We're tolerating some amount of wrongness, but we probabilistically fix it. And, and uh, we think that there's a lot of value in this approach. Now, there are strategies to mitigate the vulnerability window without synchronization. Uh, for example, I call these breadcrumbs. So for example, when Alice starts her calculation, she could drop a breadcrumb on the cache that says, hey, I'm here, I'm working on this. And then, when Bob comes along and changes his price, he'll drop a breadcrumb on the cache saying, I've been here, I've invalidated this. And now, when Alice finishes her calculation and she sees Bob's breadcrumb there, she knows not to put her results back into that cache. And thus, uh, people in the future see that the cache is empty, do the recalculation, and get the right result. Now, you might think from this that breadcrumbs just solve the problem, but they don't. There are still race conditions possible. What they do is they narrow the window of time during which the races can happen. So, um, you know, I call this mitigating non-determinism, mitigating the errors introduced by the lack of synchronization. So I did some experiments, could certainly do more on this. I ran in small talk both on an 8-core uh, Mac Pro and a 64-core Tylera chip. And the first experiment sort of revealed the obvious, that uh, something without synchronization scales better than something with kind of dumb synchronization. Uh, then I did an experiment where I uh, turned off invalidation, so there'd be a lot of staleness, and I tried it with and without the breadcrumbs. And what you can see is that the green lines are lower down than the red lines, uh, and that means that by introducing the breadcrumb stuff, stale data were put in the cache less often. By the way, this breadcrumb stuff, everyone wants to think of their own twist, their own improvement on the breadcrumb algorithm. And, and we had to really avoid the temptation to just dive in and optimize breadcrumbs for everything. But it would be a cool thing to do for some you know, enterprising graduate student to do someday. In the next experiment, I turn back on the invalidation and the breadcrumbs. Uh, another experiment I'm not showing you says that the round robin freshener policy works very well, thanks to, to Mark Wegman, my, my manager. 
one of the interesting things about working at IBM Research is just how bright uh, everyone is there, including, surprisingly, the new management. But that's another story. Yeah. So, um, anyway, what these results show is if we look at how often a query returns a stale datum, not how often the stale data are cached, but how often a query returns a stale result. As we spend more of our time freshening versus working, that goes down as you'd expect. So for example, on this right-hand curve, we're using 16 cores. We're varying the number of fresheners from 0 to 14. Uh, and then the number of workers vary from 16 down to 2. Uh, and at 50% freshening and working, uh, less than 20% of the returns is looking for stale. Well, OK, but how stale were they? And um, I know there are a lot of curves on here. But if you look at the center right-hand curve, this is showing the 90th percentile of how stale a result was when a result was stale. And what this is saying is that 90% of the time, the results were less than eight query times stale. This is, again, running 50-50 fresheners and workers. Well, if you put these results together for this simple experiment, what we can say is um, only 2%. Remember, 90% of the time, they're less than eight times stale. Uh, less than 20% of the results are stale. So putting them together, you know, uh, only 2% of all queries return results for staler than eight query times. So that's kind of neat. Remember, no application level synchronization here. So to summarize this part of the talk, instead of using synchronization to solve the cache race condition, we just threw in these fresheners to do this extra work that might or might not be needed. And as a result, we got kind of an interesting result. And, and this is what I mean by race and repair, or anti-lock computing. And uh, you know, again, this goes to reinforce my point, which is we want to embrace and manage inconsistency to get the scaling. Now, let's suppose we have a spreadsheet and some result is ultra-critical, like it's going to launch a missile or something, if it ever goes above 100. Well, for that result, you might want the user to say, this is critical, and do the locking along that one path. And that's what I mean by end-to-end -end non-determinism. If we're going to venture off into the world of good enough, soon enough, there may be applications or parts of an application where that varies according to which particular output we're talking about. OK. Now what I'm going to do is talk about data structure. So let me give you a little background. We have this application, and sometimes our users not only query or change data, but they add new data. And that corresponds to adding new cells to the queue. And the cells in our cube are accessed by hash tables. So now we want hash tables in which we can perform insertions without synchronization. And here is basically the kind of hash tables uh, we're talking about. It's a, it uses buckets on a chain. So the thing over on the left is an array that's um, hashed into by bucket. That points to the head of a linked list of buckets, which are things that all hash to the same place. In the top row, you have a hash table that contains uh, two entries that happen to collide in hashing, one entry with key APL and value A, and one entry with key small talk and value B. Now, uh, we want uh, only to have one thing of a given key. We're using this to represent a set, basically, uh, where the, the, the keys determine the, the uniqueness. So in the second row, if we add uh, JavaScript value C, and it happens to hash to the same place, it just gets stuck on the list. What the third row shows is if we then add JavaScript value B, we don't want anything to happen because we want this thing to act as a set. And the bottom row says, well, then if we add self value A plus, of course, we want that added in as a set. The people who know me would be laughing at this example. 
So here's the code for add. Yes, exactly. So a little bit of, of sub rosa language uh, frames in there, right? So here's the code for add uh, in sort of a pigeon C, C++, whatever. Uh, the for loop, what it's doing in the very first line is it's hashing into the bucket array and storing that pointer in node. Then it uses a standard risk reversal for loop looking to see if the key is already in there. Returns if it's already there. Uh, then what it does, it creates a new node object, assuming it's not. Sets its context to the association we're adding. Sets the next pointer of the new node to point to the head of the list and then uh, stores that in the bucket array. Stores the new node in the bucket array. And uh, just a few more notational things. This long expression appears you know, three times in there. So because I'm a lazy C program, I'm just going to use a pointer variable. So BP will point to that word of the bucket array. Same code as before, just using the pointer variable. And to make the slides easier, I'm going to use this kind of flowcharty notation with these boxes, a fine bucket corresponding to the, you know, the hashing and, and going into the array, a return of duplicate corresponding to the for loop. Make new node means not only allocate the new node object, but set its contents to be you know, the point to the key value thing. And then set new node uh, next from bucket means setting that next pointer in that new node object. And storing it into the bucket is finally putting its address in the array. Well, as you all probably know, if we try to run this in parallel, bad things happen. So, for example, uh, we can miss an insertion into the set. Again, there are two threads, one on the left, one on the right. They are inserting two different things, but they happen to hash into the same list. Uh, they each make the new node. Uh, but one, you know, but the new node next pointer is stored into that old list that neither of them have changed. And then one stores the new node into the bucket, the other stores the new node into the bucket, and the first store is lost because it never happened. So the result is running in parallel with that synchronization, we miss an insertion. Uh, not only that, but we can add, we can have duplicates. The same key can be added twice. If you look at this particular interleaving and where they're both trying to add the exact same key at basically the same time, if uh, the second one sets its new node next value after the first one has updated the list head, then it will end up pointing to that list that has the new key added by the first one. But it won't know it's been added because it did its duplicate duplicate check earlier before the first one did anything. And in this particular ordering, the same key can be stored twice in the list. Everyone follow this? Okay, great. And, uh, you know, again, just to illustrate, if we store uh, the same key in the list at the same time in the two middle rows, we can end up with it twice in the same list. Okay. Well, here's what's interesting about this. We're going to make just a real simple change to our program. Again, because I'm kind of a lazy C programmer. Not only will I have that pointer variable, but I'll read it into a local variable called head. And I will use that local variable to search for the duplicate. And I will also use that same local variable to set the new node's next pointer. Now, it's a very simple little change. Here's what it looks like flowchart wise. And I'm using this word head in italics to denote the local variable. So we read, we read the, ver the value of that bucket into head. We do the duplicate search based on head. And we set the new node next pointer based on head. Now, here is what uh, kind of knocked me off my chair when I saw it. With this simple change, it is now impossible to have these duplicates in the list. Let me explain this. 
the red arrows show the same value. Here's our interleaving as before. Uh, these things grab the list into head. They do the duplicate search based on head. The new node is made. The new node next is set from head. Because on the right, the new node next pointer is set to the list as it was when the duplicate search occurred. The add from the left is if it never happened. And so the thread on the right wins. And our duplicate key is only added once to the list. No application level synchronization. And we have knocked out a whole class of error. To me, that's pretty darn interesting. Now, before uh, you guys fall out of your chairs, we still have the other failure. You can still fail to insert two distinct keys that happen to hash to the same list. Again, uh, just as before, you know, the insertion that the guy on the left does is as if it never happens because this store gets overwritten by the one on the right. And in fact, this window is a bit larger because of when this new node next value, was that when that was read, when that's set. Okay. Well, you know from the talk, so far there are going to be mitigation strategies. Well, the first strategy is the baseline. No check at all. This is the thing you've been seeing all along. Find a bucket, read the head, return a duplicate at head, set the note next from head, set the note next. That's the baseline. Then there's the extreme thing, the way you guys are probably taught now. This is using the atomic compare and swap instructions I mentioned at the head of the talk. Now, this instruction does a whole lot of stuff in one instruction. Like it, it locks that bucket memory location, sees if it's equal to what it thinks it ought to be. If so, it does the store and unlocks the bucket. And if it has been changed, it'll unlock the bucket. And then the software has to go around and try again. So this is sort of a very severe, more than mitigation, elimination strategy at the cost of an atomic instruction. But what we could do, we could do the same thing without the atomicity, just using regular old instructions. I call this the check head before store. And here what happens is, Right before this thing is going to do its store of the head of, of its new node right into, into the bucket, it sees if the bucket still has the old value it read before, conforming to its assumptions. And if it does, it does the store. And if it doesn't, it has to loop and retry. This is exactly the same as compare and swap without the atomicity guarantee from the instruction. That's all it is. Now, there's another idea. If it's cool to have my manager be so brilliant, it is really cool to have his manager be brilliant too. And that's what happened here. Brett Halpern pointed out that there was this notion of intention locks. And here's how they work. They turn out to be a lot like breadcrumbs. We add an extra word to our bucket array. And we put the thread ID in there when starting and check it towards the end. So for example, you might check that thread ID right before you do the store. So this is the algorithm as before, except up near the top, the third box for those remote folks, the thread ID, you put your thread ID in the lock. And then down here, right before you do the store in the diamond on the flow chart, you check to see if the lock still has your thread ID. This is, this is like breadcrumbs, right? You drop your breadcrumb, you see if it's still there. You can also do that check afterwards instead of before. You could even do it before and after. So here are the various mitigation strategies. You can um, use the atomic instruction. You can check the bucket without the atomicity. You can use the intention locks before or after. You can do nothing and say, well, you know, there's the error rate is what it is and higher levels of the software have to cope. Well, I ran an experiment. <laughs> I coded this up in C++. 
Ran it on my 8-core Mac for now. Love to run it on more cores in the future. So this is multi-core, not many-core. I tried it with one thread as a baseline and eight threads. And I varied the list strategies and the experiments. The list strategies are exactly what I've been talking about all along. The experiments were, as a baseline, I said, we'll let each thread insert into a different list. So it's got keys that'll hash into a different list, so there's no contention. And I also bumped up the allocation granularity to try to eliminate false sharing. Uh, then there's the max contention case. Each thread is inserting into the same list. Then I said, well, you know, let's try sort of an Ethernet-inspired strategy. Each thread's inserting into the same list, but after an insert attempt, it'll wait a while, basically the same time it took to do the insert, see if the insert seems to have succeeded. If it didn't succeed, it'll do a binary exponential back off. Everyone know what that means? and then go around the loop and try again. Basically, it waits an amount of time, and if it fails again, it waits double that amount of time. Okay, so what happened? Well, before I can tell you that, I have to say these are early results, unreviewed, and there may be error. But here we go. The first thing I'm going to show you is the miss rate, and that is how often did one of these insertions think it worked, but in fact, it didn't work because of the race conditions. And uh, I, there are a lot of bars on these charts. Let me explain them. Each group of bars is for a list strategy. So the top group is for the no checks. The next group is checking the intention lock before, checking it after, next, checking it before and after. The penultimate group is the checklist head, that is without the atomicity without the atomicity. And the last one is the cast with the atomicity. And within each group, there are the three experiments. No contention, max, and max with retry. So, for example, the very top bar, no contention, there is no bar because there were no misses. If they're all going into different lists, well, they all work. There are no races. The second bar is uh, no checks, and in fact, 80% of those insertions fail. So, you know, we've got a serious race condition here. And the next bar shows with the retries, uh, that really helped the failures, cut them down by quite a bit. And of course, the, um, uh, the CAS one you know, has no misses ever because it's atomic. And the checklist head one is interesting, right, because it has uh, only 20% instead of 80%, as, as are the, some of the uh, intention lock bars. Okay. So I put gold stars next to kind of the pretty interesting results. You can see where they are there. Now remember, some of these strategies have this backward arc in the flow chart. And that means that on for any given insertion, the average number of times around the loop can be greater than one. Well, what is that number? Now, all of a sudden, we see some of these strategies aren't so great. Because like uh, the check lock before thing, which really reduced the misses, well, that's going around the loop a thousand times for every insert. That's not so hot. Uh, and even the compare and swap version is going around the loop like six times. Remember, this is a logarithmic scale. Okay, well, what does that mean in terms of insertion time? So first, the baseline. This is just one thread running, the insertion times. And you can see the retry bars are larger, and that's because of the delay and the resample. So the retries are not, the, re, the whole retry experiment isn't going to look very interesting from a performance point of view. But here's what's cool I'm going to switch to the slide with eight threads. And it's all been carefully set up so you can watch the bars grow as I switch slides. Everybody watching? Now, the first bar I want you to watch is that very top yellow bar, okay? This is no contention, no synchronization. You kind of expect it not to grow. But guess what? It grew. It grew. Just, and, and 
you know, I try to eliminate all the false sharing. I'm not using any synchronization as far as I know. And yet, things are slowing down. Okay, the next bar to watch, but you can watch the second bar, the unchecked max contention. And that grows too. Now, you know, the problem there is where you know, 80% of our insertions just aren't working. So that's not going to be too high. And if you watch the retry bars, well, they're just growing by a lot. So, I again, being a, I'm, somehow I have a kindergarten teacher buried in me, I guess. I gave them gold stars and red X's for the interesting ones. Now, the obvious thing to do is to plot this on two dimensions, right? Let's look at the miss rate versus the performance. And that's what this is. So, the higher something is, the more lossy the insertions are, the more of a miss. And the closer they are to me, that is, the more to the left, I mean, the more to the right, the slower they are. And I will show you the labels. I tossed out, you know, the ridiculous data points already. That leaves four. So we start with the unchecked version, which is missing a lot, but it's relatively <coughs> fast. And also the check lock after version is about the same. Then the next one that's going to be pretty interesting is this checklist head because it cuts down the misses a lot and it doesn't hurt the performance as much. Finally, we get to compare and swap, which has no misses, but it's a lot slower than checklist head. Well, yeah, but... But wait, but wait. Now, if we had only one thread running, of course, we're only using one thread, but look how good that thing is. It's like way down, no misses, and fast. So there's this concurrency penalty in this experiment, which is kind of sad. But anyway... Well, in this experiment, I only had I, could, I only ran one thread or eight threads. That would really be interesting data, and I'm going to pursue that. I have access to a 48 core chain of 64 bits. Okay, great early results. I think this is a whole interesting new area opening up. And so those are the kinds of questions that ought to be asked. Okay, let me go. I went back a little too far. Yeah, I'd like people. Can you identify yourself if you if you feel comfortable? It's just nice to know who's asking questions too. Yeah, yeah I'm Michael point. Chuck. I'm surprised that the unchecked isn't the fastest. Well, so am I, to tell you the truth. And well, at least they ought to be the same speed. And all I can think of is sorry, caching effects. Uh, I'm with you. Could be, could be. I mean, one of the lessons from this is you do something that seems really simple and you get these results that, you know, you, kind of, you have to like spend endless amount of time diving into fancy tools. So that's a lesson for environments. Okay. But let me go on to this slide. I tried to come up with a scalar figure of merit. So I said, look, uh, the successes per millisecond, which we want to be big, we could, we could represent that as the average number of successes per attempt, which is 1 minus the miss rate. Uh, I'm not getting fancy with, with Bernoulli distributions or anything. Times the attempts per millisecond. In other words, how fast we do each attempt. And with this simple figure of merit, what's really interesting is that check list head beats out compare and swap. Now this is only eight cores, right? And we're looking at a future with a thousand cores. And already, there, this result is popping out. So I think this is extremely provocative. Now, sadly, the one thread number is like way over here somewhere. But OK. So to summarize uh, this part of the talk, I think there's this whole new exciting area opening up which I just call probabilistic data structures. Someone else will have a better name. 
And these are data structures that work without synchronization, where we mitigate the race errors, and that are very useful. You know, they provide more value than the standard synchronized ones in appropriate settings. I don't think people have studied this too much. And you know, what you're looking at is not a huge number of weeks of work on my part. It's just the beginning of this interesting area opening up. And uh, we've seen a confirmation that accuracy trades off against performance and this intriguing provocative result that compare and swap may not win. And uh, there's this penalty for these atomic instructions, especially when you have contention. Uh, I have a quick aside, but I'm running low on time. I'll just say that once you start programming this way, you can't count on the invariance. This shows uh, when I wanted to free up the memory from this uh, C++ no garbage collection. I could do it by sweeping the cell set to find the cells, freeing them, sweeping the constraint set to find the constraints, freeing them, and everything was hunky-dory. But that broke the minute I did this dynamic cell addition with only probabilistic adding, because some of the arrows that should be there weren't. And so the freeing algorithm had to find all the cells it could, then find all the constraints from the cells, and find all the cells from the constraints to hit a fixed point, free everything up, and even there, in this world, there could be memory leaks. In this, but, you know, in a garbage collected language, wouldn't be. So interesting things when you start thinking this way. If I had to summarize this talk, what I would say is the hardware trends are pushing us towards, I think, a paradigm switch in the way we think about how we program, where we're going to be giving up uncertainty, determinism, and repeatability, and maybe try to probabilistically bound them. You know, uh, we think of this as good enough, soon enough, trace and repair, anti-lock. The invariants you like to rely upon in your program become probable. I mean, they really were always only probable anyway. Ask me about Martin Reiner's work later. And uh, there's this great new cool opportunity since we're going to be thinking a whole different way to invent and investigate and find the engineering trade-offs with new data structures <coughs> and algorithms. And the only question in my mind is, will we be flexible enough to actually do it? So thank you very, very much. Ted Sauker, um, we're running a little late, but I think this is really interesting stuff. I really want us to take the time. It might be something for us to leave for other meetings, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, the first question I'm going to ask that's not the first question I'm going to ask is, it, I, just, I just see hardware support for all these things being possible, and uh, I don't know if that's an interesting uh, thing that you thought about also. Well, the way I would say it is lack of hardware support becomes possible now. So, um, you know, the hardware designers kill themselves to give us cash coherency guarantees and store ordering guarantees and um, uh, make, you know, these atomic instructions efficient when there's out, when there's no contention, and even as efficient as they can when there is. Uh, I suspect a lot of the overhead of some of these things is buried in every cycle, being an old risk guy from Patterson, that without some of these guarantees, even things that don't seem to rely on ordering like every read from the cache might be faster because the control paths might be shorter. So I think the opportunity here is for the hardware guys to relax the guarantees they give us since we're worried about things that are not synchronized at the application level anyway and, and make it easier on them, you know, faster design cycles, maybe uh, faster hardware than they may otherwise give us. Uh, I still don't see around having an entire word synchronized. You know, so when you store a word, you'd like to know that all the bits either get stored or none of the bits get stored. It seems like you could also you could relax in your old ways and just add thread counts on them. Yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you.
Uh, I'm trying to understand your question and boil it down. Are you asking if even with breadcrumbs errors can happen? Oh, I say if if you are willing to avoid these errors, then you might have to wait a lot because say some threads with the competing a part of the reduction sum C his, his breadcrumb is not still there. I mean after he started the computation. That might affect the performance. That will so you're saying if I want no errors, I have to wait longer. Yeah. Well, that's that. Sure, that's this correctness performance trade-off. I think you can always reduce the probability of these race errors by adding delays in the system. I, you don't look so satisfied. I, I tell you what. Think about your question. See if you can boil it down, and I'll at, a, answer other people while you try to to boil it down. Uh, yeah, you in the black shirt. You're, you're going to contrast your idea with regard to the advantage of the match cycle or the hide, which the CM1 and CM5 various factors are looking at. So I think this is very much in the spirit of swarms and hides. I, I would rather compare than contrast. I think what I'm saying is. Um, Anything we want to be scalable past a certain point, we'll have to think in terms of swarms and hives. Does that satisfy your perception? Oh, pardon me. I'm hopeful that you said, since you mentioned actually ACL, yeah. which is one of those, why haven't we heard from ACL in decades? Yeah. Thing. But I think what concerns me, I was with Burton Smith last week, I, I'm of the opinion that we are probably going to have to have some architectural changes when looking what those are going to be. The problem is the majority of students trained in the last few decades have never encountered an architecture like back to the Janelle Core Hell, as an example. Very few computer scientists have even had a chance to do that. Um, or pure hardware data flow architectures that were done, attempted back in that era of the Mac II. Um, even at IBM, the RP3, the GF11, uh, GF1, I'm curious to see what architectural things are going to be added to the hardware. Sounds good. Also, uh, you mentioned some machines I'm not familiar with, so I hope you can stay afterwards for cookies and educate me. i got to go meet the Swiss supercomputer people at 3 o'clock. Speaking of which, I, just because we um, you know, normally have to educate at 2.30, but I think that we do want to hear maybe one more question, then we'll move out to the hall. Anybody have questions? Okay, there's two babbling questions. Maybe we'll get both. Okay, um, I was curious about the the freshener effect. If you have a lot of thread, extra threads working on uh, recomputing data, what's the power consumption effect of that? Is that going to be prohibitive? Well, the interesting question is to compare that against the power consumption of using a lot of synchronization. And uh, I don't know the answer, but synchronization involves communication, and communication takes power, you know, to drive the capacitance of the interconnect. On the other hand, extra work takes power too. So, beats me, Batman. What what I do hear is that um, uh, the folks at IBM who actually in, are in charge of divisions that make and sell these applications, you know, talk about scaling as something really important, and I haven't heard them talk about power as so important to our particular customers for these applications. But who knows? example would say sort of one level deep, uh, usually uh, hackers and stalkers will have major threads to the other hackers and the other hackers and so on. So I could just see things like one is that uh, error early on using flexible calculations will magnify the threads to the 
bigger topic. And also, uh, as we reset Adam on twelve stone to fix it, that the process even with the building of this larger So your question is what would I say to those two points? If I've understood. Yeah, sure. So um, errors might propagate and magnify, or errors might propagate and diminish, depending on the calculation. And I can see that if I have a spreadsheet and it's doing a subtraction between two nearly equal numbers, I might actually need to get that right. Because numer numerical analysis teaches us that that's a real critical case. Uh, so uh, again, there's this notion of making the punishment fit the crime. In our model, the, the computations all go back to the leaves, so we don't have computations looking at other computations. But if you did that, what would you do? Uh, you could have the fresheners follow these paths up if they got a different answer. Or you could just say, eventually another freshener will come along and fix that one. And that's, I haven't done that research, so I don't know. But uh, it's part of this whole new field. What, you know, what do you do about that? So thank you very much for a great talk. Um, everybody, and let's move out into the hall instead of having the questions uh, at the podium. Sure. Uh, but, Thank uh, you all for coming. You want to answer that now? I'd say yeah, yes, absolutely. Hybrid approach would be important. Okay, thank you very much.